my name is Anil Chatterjee. Uh, I'm based in University of Otago and uh, I work pretty closely with uh, Peter Stockel. Um, and uh, I'll present some um, work and, and some ideas which will help you to understand the content of this workshop. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I'm in India with my family, but uh, I'll connect uh, via internet. Um, so, let's start with the presentation. Um, and uh, first I'll start with uh, some background of DNA methylation because I think it's important to understand that and then go into reduced representation by sulfide sequencing. Um, RRB is a technique that we used a lot and will be a main focus of this workshop. So, uh, first part uh, relates to DNA methylation analysis and some background of DNA methylation and then uh, how to prepare RRBs or reduce representation by sulfide sequencing libraries. So, we'll go through the steps. Uh, so, DNA methylation is uh, probably the most stable and, and the fundamental epigenetic mark. So, uh, changes that happens um, in the structure of the DNA or um, the covalent modification of DNA without underlying uh, changing the underlying sequence and that's epigenetic changes. And as you can see, um, DNA methylation, which is uh, basically 5-methyl cytosine. So cytosine, one of the bases um, of, of DNA, um, gets a methyl group incorporated uh, and becomes 5-methyl cytosine. And, and that's basically we call uh, DNA methylation. And almost always in mammalian genome, this cytosine gets methylated in a CG context. So when a C comes to next to a G, those Cs are the ones that generally um, gets methylation. So we call that a CPG. Um, we'll come to non-CPG later on, but, but these are the main uh, methylation mark in the mammalian genome. Um, another important concept to understand uh, is CPG island. So generally the CPGs that I just mentioned are quite unevenly distributed across the genome. Um, and there are regions that you will not find CPG at all. So you look for like, I don't know, 1000 base pair and there won't be any CPGs. But there are regions where they come together uh, very closely and, and quite tightly packed and, and uh, those regions are called CPG islands. So there's multiple CPGs in that, in that fraction of the genome. And uh, we have around 27,000 CPG island in human genome. And an important uh, thing about CPG island is they are generally very close to the promoter. So uh, 60 to 70 percent of human gene promoter contains a CPG island. And changes in DNA methylation status in CPG islands are shown to be associated with gene expression changes. Therefore, study of CPG island became quite important. And then you will come across CPG islands and, and related concept later on uh, as you do the contents of the uh, workshop. So very globally and very broadly, uh, this is a principle of analyzing genome-wide DNA methylation um, data or doing an experiment uh, which will uh, profile genome-wide DNA methylation. So in the first step, we do a local treatment um, and uh, that is basically to distinguish the methylated and unmethylated CPG sites. Because I told you the DNA sequence is not changing, of course, it is the, all the Cs. But some Cs or some CPGs have methylation mark in them, some don't. So this local treatment distinguish these two so that later on when we analyze them, we can separate uh, them and, and interpret them. So once you do the local treatment, then the next step is actually to do the thing to get the information out. And uh, that's a part of global interrogation or global analysis. And um, it used to be arrays or micro array type of platform, still a very popular platform. And another alternative way of doing that is sequencing. So you sequence that um, locally altered genome uh, and then map to the genome and then try to get the information out from that. Um, these three are the main um, type of local treatment that generally is done. There are several different variants of it but these are the, basically the main three type. So the first one here is restriction enzyme. So <clears throat> there are some enzymes uh, that cuts DNA in a particular motif uh, CCGG here shown here as very common motif uh, and uh, CCGG of course contains one CPG um, so there's opportunity to investigate those CPGs and some of these enzymes are methylation sensitive so if there is a methylation uh, in this kind of sequences it is not going to cut it but if there is 
no methylation is going to cut it or something like that. So therefore, you apply this enzyme and then it cuts or it doesn't and then you get a fragmented DNA um, and then you analyze that later and by doing that you know that it was methylated therefore it was cut or not methylated therefore it was not cut. So it allows that discrimination between methylated and unmethylated sites. B is a bisulfide treatment and by far this is the most commonly used uh, method to distinguish methylated and unmethylated cytosine. And uh, the, the basic idea here is that uh, uh, you have methylated or unmethylated cytosine and uh, by a sort of chemical treatment, sodium bisulfite treatment, and that's why called bisulfite treatment, it changes the unmethylated cytosine into use, so uracil, and after PCR you see them as T. So cytosine, uh, CPG cytosine and unmethylated cytosine becomes T. However, the methylated cytosine is resistant to this treatment, so they don't change. So at the end, uh, this methylated cytosine remains as methylated cytosine. So if you see a C at the end, you know it was methylated. And if it became a T, that means it was unmethylated, therefore it changed. So it gives sort of a base resolution um, uh, you know, way to, to distinguish methylated and unmethylated cytosine. And RRB is, uses that, and we'll come to that in a moment. A third and, and quite popular, but I think it's getting less popular now, um, is to use antibody-based method. So you have methylated cytosine and uh, you have antibody that is designed to pull down a particular region of the genome um, that are um, heavily methylated. So this antibody is basically bind to methylated CP CPGs and therefore it pulls it down and then you sonicate those or fragment those and then uh, analyze them, either you amplify them or put through arrays of sequencing and the platform I talked about and then analyze at the end. But in this case, you don't get single base resolution. You get a sort of a chunk of a genome which is methylated or unmethylated and pull it down, analyze as a sort of a large chunk instead of base pair by base pair. And then, as I mentioned, uh, after all, either of the treatment, you take them the DNA is to either array-based techniques or high-throughput technique and then analyze later. And uh, this is just a sort of a, um, you know, very broad idea of some of the methods and it's, it's again um, sort of talking about the same idea where you did the local treatment and there's three types of treatment here highlighted in the um, in, in pre-treatment section in this table here um, and then um, you know, local specific analysis, and then you do a gel-based analysis, array-based analysis, and next-gen sequencing or NGS-based analysis. So in each of these local treatment, um, you can take them through and then uh, analyze um, in, in many different way, whatever technique you like or whatever technique you have established in the lab, and then analyze genome-wide. As you can see, the sodium bisulfite one, and uh, if you see the NGS-based analysis, RRBs is one of them, and that, that uh, allows you to do single base uh, methylation analysis uh, based on bisulfide treatment at a, at a genome wide scale. Alright, so now we will focus on RRBS and the uh, um, library preparation steps. So the first step uh, is digest the DNA with MSP1 enzyme. So DNA could be from any, any source, um, uh, but this method has mainly been worked out for mice uh, and humans and we have done that for zebrafish as well. So the MSP1 cleaves the DNA at uh, CCGG site and uh, it is methylation insensitive. So that means um, this CG uh, in the sequence, if it was methylated or unmethylated, doesn't matter, the MSP1 site is going to cut it anyway. So you, you end up with a MSP1 digested uh, fragmented DNA. Then we end repair it. So uh, because you have cut it CCGG, there will be hanging um, Cs or you know Gs at the end. We repair it um, by end repair reaction and then we ligate methylated adapters at the end of it so that the flow cell uh, can recognize these this, um, sequences. And the reason for adding methylated adapter is that um, bisulfide conversion, as I told you, can change the unmethylated cytosine into T's at the end. Uh, but in, for the adapter sequences, we do not want any change because you want these adapter sequences to be recognized by flow cell. Therefore, we add methylated adapter so they remain unchanged even after bisulfide treatment. And then we cut out a small section of the genome, so 40 to 220 base pair fragment we have used, and that's a classical protocol, and we'll get back to this uh, a bit later on. And uh, 
this is actually the reduced representation so by selecting 40 to 220 base pair um, you're selecting only 2.5 percent of the genome uh, and by selecting only 2.5 percent of the genome you are basically avoiding a lot of sequencing but still getting 30 fold enrichment of cpg rich uh, regions or cpg island that i mentioned to you so you're still getting important region um, that is more likely to cause uh, changes in gene expression but with much less sequencing then we do bisulfide treatment, uh, do bisulfide treatment, and that is basically to distinguish um, cytosine um, and methylated and methylated cytosine, as I described before, um, and then we amplify it to get enough DNA or um, fragments and sequence, and we have sequenced in Illumina machines mainly. Uh, this is just a small, a small fact sheet of RRB's uh, libraries, and uh, as you can see, we select 40 to 220 base pair. You get six and a half, um, you know, 100,000 MSP1 fragments. By doing that, or by doing the selection, it's only 7.4 megabase of the genome, so a very small quantity, but you still get 4 million CPG sites um, out of 13 million, so 14%. So there's enrichment there, but you get almost 24,000 CPG islands, so massive enrichment in terms of CPG islands. Uh, and, and that's the whole point of doing it sequence list, but get a lot out of it. Um, this is again the steps, but in more detail, or you know, showing the sequence here so that you have um, the steps in your mind, visualizing it. So, genomic DNA, um, and the next step uh, this is a sequence, so a hypothetical sort of sequence. Um, MSP1 cleaves it at CCGG, and as you can see, then you have overhanging bases there because as a result of MSP1 cutting, uh, this need to be filled in first. So, we have filled in with uh, you know, normal. C or DCTP and those are unmethylated and, and this will become important later and I'll explain it later but for now just keep in mind um, that we are just filling with normal C and normal cytosine in the lab that you use is unmethylated. Once that is done then we add a A base at the end of it um, so it's called 3 prime A base addition and this is required for the adapter to ligate to it because if it is blunt ended then the adapter will find it hard to ligate, right? So we need to have give some sort of primer or some sort of sequence tag for adapter to recognize. So we add an A base um, at a three prime end of it. So now you have an A base added on both sides, and then next step is to ligate uh, adapters because the adapter has a three prime T overhang and it ligates there. Uh, then we do a gel size selection, uh, as I mentioned, 40 to 220 base pair, and there's a very small sort of miniature photo there, and the ladders are there, and then we have cut out a 40 to 220 base pair fragment, and we do bisulfite uh, conversion, PCR amplification, which I explained to you before, and then we do massively parallel sequencing, and you get lots and lots of reads, millions of reads, uh, to be analyzed. So when you add all these and, and adapters and, and things like that, how, how it overall looks like one fragment. So this is an example of a hypothetical fra fragment. Um, so, um, you know, the, the top one is more of a cartoon and the bottom one is the actual sequence uh, to, to understand it better. So the, um, the blue color uh, there um, is, is a sequence in the middle bit, uh, the um, digested DNA. Um, and then the A overhangs are in red, as you can see. The CG is there, the, the fuchsia pink. Those are the filled in bases, right? And in the A where the added three prime in the added base for the adapter to ligate to it. And as you can see the blue color one, the adapter that ligates later, because you have added an A overhang, it helps to ligate it. And then within the adapter, there's a barcode of six bases. So you will see that here in green color. And this barcode helps us when you have sequence and when you sequence 10 samples in, in one lane, they're all mixed up. The sequence is coming from all the 10 samples. But if you have used different adapters uh, for preparing those 10 samples, then by using that barcode that is there in green color, we can then demultiplex and then put those 10 samples into 10 different files. Although from the machine, they came out as one. So that's the use of the barcode and, and it's, it's kind of um, almost compulsory these days to use different barcodes so that more multiplexing could be done. Um, this is sort of example of a successful RRBS library and uh, I'm showing three libraries here. Um, and as you can see, there's two cycles that has been used, 15 cycles of PCR and 20 cycles of PCR 
in each case and in each case uh, the libraries were quite nicely amplified with a uh, higher number of a higher amount of product in 20 cycles compared to 15 cycles uh, it is important that we choose a minimal cycle number that will give you enough uh, dna uh, to sequence because if you go for too uh, high a cycle number for pcr then you end up having more uh, duplication or amplification bias so in this case for example we will probably select 15 because we see that 15 cycle is giving us enough DNA enough amplification that we can sequence um, but for diagnostic purposes you could try different cycle number 12 cycle maybe 15 cycle and 18 cycle and see at, at what cycle number you're getting enough product from the gel so uh, you visualize uh, this part from the gel um, uh, then then we sequence um, uh, with using Illumina machines and uh, Initially, when we started this uh, sort of work, uh, we were sequencing in GA2 machines, uh, and that used to give us 20 to 25 million read per lane. Uh, but now we have HiSeq 2500. There's this sequencing, um, the improvement in sequencing machine and chemistries is really phenomenal. Uh, and we now get uh, 200 to 300 million reads. So basically, um, we can multiplex four, five, six RB sample perhaps in one lane. Um, and still get enough amount of data almost in same cost so so that's that's been really great uh, this is here a, a photo of mine in our um, NZGL facility in Otago um, and on the top the image there uh, that's basically just gives you idea of how the fragments um, gets uh, into flow cell and then uh, flow cell is like a velcro so the um, fragments it gets attached there because you have added a sequence and this velcro basically knows that of the sequence so as a result of that it gets attached and once it gets attached and then the polymerase chain reaction starts which is basically a glorified pcr really um, and then once the dntp the bases get sequenced they sort of create a cluster you know as you can see in the next uh, you know in this this uh, other image a lot of clusters are being formed um, so they're basically clones uh, or multiple fragments and then there's more and more and more of clusters and then eventually um, they get sequenced and then the basis gets recorded uh, and you get a sequence at the end. So that's basically very broadly that's the principle. And, and there are a lot of the online documentation and, and material there if you really want to understand uh, in, in more detail. So I think that's part one. Uh, and uh, show, soon I'll discuss about si some RRB signature and some tips and consideration for it. But I think this is the library preparation. Um, and later on, I'll, I'll come and uh, join you and uh, take uh, questions if you have. So uh, thank you for your time uh, for this part.